Uh, so this is your first week with us. Uh, we are in a series called In the Gap, and the series started <coughs> on Easter. And the idea was, what we broke down is just the idea that there are moments in life <coughs> where God says something, and then there is a period of time before the fulfillment of that comes. And so Easter was us starting off this series. And then last week what we talked about is during the gap, what we find is that Satan is really always trying to chip away <coughs> at the belief that God is good. That if he can convince us that he isn't who he said he is, that he isn't good, that he doesn't love us, that he not good plans for us, then we don't make it out the gap. That we quit before we get to the end, that God is good. And when you understand that, what it does is it produces the ability to keep fighting, to keep pushing, to keep trusting, to watch God, get to walk all the way out until you get to the other side of that fulfillment. So today we are in week three of In the Gap. And what I want to let you know about a few things about me is uh, I'm not Jared. So guess what? If it's terrible, he's back next week. So there's that. Uh, the second thing is, is I absolutely, without question, love movies. We got any movie fans in here? Let me see some hands. Yeah, absolutely. You know why? Because they're awesome. Like, movies are fantastic. And as far as I'm concerned, the greatest day in the world is me at the Warren with my beautiful wife next to me and just the fattest bucket of popcorn. I mean, just the the warmth, the smell, like honestly, I'm not even gonna eat like half of it, but just smelling it makes the movie experience. So I love movies <clears throat> and specifically, I love the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Like I think the greatest thing in the world is when a new Marvel movie comes out and you have the premiere and you go and there's just all the energy, like everybody's extra hype, just all the noise. Like what y'all so pumped about? It's a movie and it's great. And I love the Warren movie theater, which is where I go to watch my movies. They've got a light show that goes down. I mean, all the craziness. And I remember the first time I went to the Warren and it was watch the movie Captain America Civil War. And I was extra hyped because Spider-Man was back and your boy loves Spider-Man, okay? Like I love Spider-Man. And it was crazy because before the movie started, they had this epic light show and I'm like, what is happening? It's amazing. I'm like, let's go. And the movie starts and I'm like, okay, Captain America's got black on, let's go. He's got his hair grown out, just all, cry, all, all so different looking. You got all these plot twists happening. It's like, I didn't even see that coming. Didn't see that coming. I mean, like real talk, I was on the edge of my seat from beginning to end. You could not have told me that I was not watching the greatest movie ever made <laughs> until we get to the end. <laughs> and you see, my favorite superhero of all time is Iron Man. I think he's amazing. I relate with Iron Man. I get what it's like. I think I would be Iron Man. All that money, all them cool armor. I get it, bro. I get the struggle. It's real. And like, I love him. <clears throat> and he's amazing. And then the end of the movie, Captain America and his boy Bucky just jump Iron Man. Like, what's that about? What is happening? And I'm like, that's cool, though, because Iron Man's got armor. You know what I'm saying? He's got guns and bullets and rays coming out of his chest. Ain't nobody got to give the smoke to Iron Man until they do. And they beat him. Sorry for the spoiler alert. If you hadn't seen it, that's kind of on you because it's been out a while. But regardless, uh, <clears throat> they beat Iron Man. And I'm done. Like I'm, I'm, I don't even, salty does not describe the feeling. I'm like walking out the movie theater. I refuse to accept this. This was not the story I had planned. This is not how I saw it going. And so if you ask me what the worst movie in the entire Marvel Cinematic Universe is, I will say with passion, it's Captain America Civil War. <clears throat> and the truth is it makes no sense at all. Because every moment of that movie I loved. <laughs> Until the story went away, I didn't see coming. Until the story went away, I wasn't ready for. Until the story didn't look like the story I wanted it to look like. And what happens so often in our life is we get in the gap. <laughs> and what happens is, is life starts hitting you in a way you weren't ready for. Things start going away you don't see coming. Things start rolling ways that you didn't want them to look. And then for us, we just start reframing the entire past. Like for me, it's a bad movie because I allowed one moment at the end to reframe the joy I had all the way through it. And we do that in our life all the time. Like we get in the gap and we'll look back and act like God's never been good to us. Even though he's answered prayers, he's been good. We're healthy. God's done great things in our life. God's brought us through some things, but we get in the gap. And sometimes we just reframe it all. This is just how it's always been. This is what it's like. I, I, I guess I'm never going to get any better. I, I, I guess God really didn't have a plan for me. I guess God really didn't love me. Although we've seen God do a bunch of things. <laughs> and so what's true is, is that's not just us. But that has happened and been true for human beings since the beginning of time. And one of my favorite examples of this is found in the Old Testament in King, 1 Kings. And you find the prophet Elijah. And like Elijah is so cool. 
Like this dude has like the sports center top 10 of God moments. Like it's epic. Like he's out here doing his thing and like he prays that it doesn't rain. Now listen, when he prays it doesn't rain, doesn't skip a day or two. It's three and they have years. It locks all of the rain up. Now, for those of you who have businesses or jobs where you work outside, how cool would that be? You just pray and the rain would stop. Like Elijah got that kind of answer prayer power. And then he's out here in the wilderness. He ain't got no food. So God just starts letting ravens feed him. They just start bringing him food. You know what I'm saying? Hey, you're good, bro. Let me get you some food so you can, so I'm not going to eat a bird to be honest with you. Like I'm just, it's not happening. Like if God sent it, maybe, but like, I'm still probably not eating meat out of a raven's mouth. He did. And God sent it. And then like he's doing his thing and he meets a widow and her son dies and Elijah prays for this boy and he wakes back up. Like he raises a young man from the dead. Like these are insane moments. Like Elijah has seen God do some incredible things. And then my favorite one, this might be my favorite story in all the Bible as far as just like if I got to heaven and I had a screen and on that screen, God said, you can replay all of history. Like this is my top five. (laughs) Like I'm watching this moment. And what happens is, as Elijah faces off with the prophets of Baal. And basically they're just arguing like, my God's real. No, 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 my God's real. No, my God's real. Like, no, no, but for real though, bro, like mine's real. And so there's an all argument back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And Elijah's like, all right, cool, cool, cool. Let's squash it. <laughs> let's put it to the test. Let's build an altar. We'll call on our God and whosoever God answers by fire is the real God. And the prophets of Baal are like, bet, let's go. And they're out here doing crazy stuff. Like, go read it. First Kings chapter 18. Like, they, they nuts. They're doing all, they're, they're the most extra people you'll ever meet when it comes to trying to get their God to do some things. <laughs> and there's no answer. So Elijah's like, all right, cool. My turn. Now, I don't know about you guys. I kind of like when somebody flexes. And uh, I really am with Elijah in this moment. Because he's like, no, nah, I'm not just going to call fire. Watch this. He gets water, y'all, and just starts dousing the wood. Like, we ain't going to burn dry wood. We're going to make sure it's wet, wet. Like, so wet that there's water around it. Like, this thing is soaked. He's basically made a swimming pool out of wood. And, like, it's just all wet. And it's funny to me because the whole time the prophet Baal are calling on their God, he's like, where's he at, though? Like, maybe you need to talk louder. He can't hear you. Like Elijah even's like, hey, he must be in the bathroom, bro. You know, just give him a second. You know, he'll put that newspaper down. He'll find you in a second. Never answers. Now Elijah stands here and it's covered in water. It's soaked. He said, my turn. And he calls on God and fire falls and it burns it all up. There's nothing left. It sets it all on fire. Like his God shows out. I don't know about you, but I promise you, if I ever prayed that fire would fall from heaven and it fell, game on. I'm praying it all. Like I ain't leaving nothing on the table now. Elijah sees this moment and it's crazy. And you and I will watch that story. I can speak for myself. I watch that story and I'm like, bro, you just got it. Like you and God must be like this. <clears throat> and it's crazy because in the very next chapter, <clears throat> something happens. <clears throat> See the queen Jezebel finds out about it. So she's salty. She's upset. And so she sends a messenger to Elijah and tells Elijah, hey, listen, I'm going to kill you. Like before this day's over, I'm coming for you. And Elijah is scared. Now listen, he ain't just kind of scared. He outruns chariots. Like he is gone. Like Usain Bolt don't want that smoke. Like this boy is fast and he's gone. <laughs> and he finally finds himself under a tree and he is just so distraught. And this is what he says in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 4. <clears throat> But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he prayed that he might die and said, it is enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. Take my life, I'm no better than my father's. Elijah goes from watching God do maybe one of the craziest things you'll find in all of scripture to in the next chapter, feeling so isolated and alone that he's ready for God just to take his life. How do you get there? Like, can you imagine what that must feel like to be under a tree and to be saying to God, God, just kill me. It's going to be better than what she's got for me. God, just take me out. And I watch this story. I watch this moment and I'm like, there's no, that doesn't even make sense. Like if anyone in all of the Bible knows that God's good, if anyone in all of the Bible knows that he's powerful and that he can do anything, it's this dude. Like he just saw God drop fire out of heaven. So what are you worried about the queen for? What, this doesn't even make sense. Why are you so worried? And it doesn't make sense. We watch it. We look at it and like, that's ridiculous. Elijah, you wouldn't do that until we find ourselves in those moments. Until we find ourselves in a places where it's not looking like we thought it was supposed to. 
until we find ourselves in the gap, struggling, feeling pain, hurting, and having a hard time believing our God is who he said he is. I know for me, I've had those moments. And the biggest gap I feel like I've ever been in my life took place before we came to the brick. You see, three years before we were at this church, we were youth pastors at a church, and, and we gave everything we had. Like I, and I, I can say that with certainty. Like There was nothing left on the table. All that we are, we gave to this church. And we're at the end of the thing, and the pastors call me in. They basically have a conversation. Like, listen, man, you guys are kind of in the way of our call. <clears throat> like, the thing we feel God's called us to, you're, like, you're, you're, you're in the way. you got to go. <clears throat> and it's like, you can leave, or you can quit, or I can let you go, but, like, this is where we're going with it. And just to clarify, there is no massive moral failure or crazy sin that took place they just believed we were in the way. And I cannot put into words for you what that felt like to realize that three years of our life felt wasted. Three years of my wife and I serving and sacrificing and doing everything we can to try to build this thing. I mean, we were thousands and thousands of dollars in debt because we wanted to see this thing win. <clears throat> We had gone through so much. I had put my family through so much. We had sacrificed so much to see the plan that we thought God had for us come to pass just to find out that in the end, we were in the way. Just to be told that it wasn't good enough. Just to be told that it wasn't enough. Just to be told that, no, nah, man, I can't use you. You gotta go. To tell you that I was hurt is the biggest understatement of the world. And I found myself in my driveway just falling apart. Where are you at, God. You see, what happens in moments like this is our eyes get off of God and they start looking at our surroundings, right? We, we, we miss who we're following, we miss who we're serving, and so it stops being about who God is and what he said, and it starts being about what it looks like. You ever had those moments where when you get in the gap and you get caught off guard and you start looking at everything else? For me, I was so wrapped up in comparing my life to other people's. <laughs> maybe for you, you've been trying to lose weight and you're working your hardest. You're trying to eat healthy. You're trying to work out, but it just seems like everybody else is losing weight. Like no matter what you try, no matter how hard you work, it just seems like you can't lose weight the way other people can. Maybe for you, you're trying so hard to be a good parent. You're trying to love your kids as best you know how. You're trying to do everything you can, yet you still can't go to a restaurant without them losing their minds. Like everybody else's kids seem okay, but my God, I sit down and eat a steak. It's over. And you find yourself frustrated because your life doesn't look like theirs. They seem like better parents than you. And now you're all spiraled up inside yourself because it's trying to look like somebody else. Or maybe you're trying to get promoted at work and you're working your hardest. You're giving everything you got, all that you have. And it seems like everybody else is getting promoted but you. It seems like God is moving for everyone else except you. It seems like the things that everybody else needs or want, God is showing up for. And I know for me, that's how I felt. I was looking around at my friends and the people in ministry and people I knew, and it just seemed like God was raining on everybody else. Like God was doing incredible things for everybody else. Meanwhile, I'm stuck in the car bawling my eyes out because everything I thought God said for me fell apart. I was so lost. I was so broken. I was so frustrated. And I found myself asking God, like, why don't you move for me like you move for them? Like, what's wrong in me? What, like, what am I doing so wrong that you can't answer prayers for me the way you answer for them? God, I'm giving everything I got to this. I'm not holding anything back from you, God. Why aren't you moving in my ministry like that, God? Why aren't you doing things in my life like you're doing for everybody else? What's wrong with me? I'm just so hurt because I don't look like other people. God isn't moving in my life the way I thought he should. I'm stuck in a gap and all I feel is pain. And what sucks about that is so much in life when you are hurting, it doesn't just stop at you. But the people closest to you have to feel it too. There are moments in your life where you're hurting and it feels like the people closest to you are the ones that feel the sting. I mean, they say the saying that hurt people hurt people. Maybe for you, your boss is awful. Like he or she is just terrible to you. They treat you bad. You're trying to do things. They're telling you you're not good enough, that you can't do it, that you can't make it, that you're doing all these different things wrong. So you're sitting here trying to do your best to do your job, and all they ever do is tell you you're not enough. So then you go home, and now you start making fights with your spouse that weren't even there. 
Things are a big deal that aren't a big deal. Like it doesn't even matter. On any other day, this would not have been a fight, but I'm hurt and I'm upset because my boss treats me bad. So now I'm gonna come home and take it all out on you. I'm fighting you about stuff that's not worth fighting about. (laughs) Or maybe for you, it's you're at work and you're dealing with crazy people all day long. Like just every person that comes in seems to be more mad about one thing. Like every customer you have to wait on seems to treat you awful. And then you go home and you're so frustrated and burnt out because people were awful to you that the second your kids step out of line, you lose it on them. And they're just being kids. They're just doing their own thing, minding their own business. They're just being children and you can't handle it because you're so hurt because your day has been so hard and now they feel the sting of that. Maybe for you, home is difficult and it's not good at home. Maybe your marriage is struggling. Maybe your kids aren't listening. And everywhere you go, you bring that chaos. You aren't trying to hurt anybody. You just hurt. And because you're hurt, other people have to feel that sting. You see, for me, this message was really, really hard um, to prep for because I didn't want to lie to you and I want to be honest. And I knew that during those three years, we had been through some things and I didn't, like, I, I, I had made some sacrifices that I shouldn't have. I knew, that I'd ca- <clears throat> I knew that I'd caused pain. And so I asked my wife, I was like, hey, I just want to be honest. I want to talk about where we were, like what we went through. <clears throat> so I want to know, like, what were your hardest moments? Like, what was difficult about that for you? I said, she's okay. And I get home on Monday night. She gives me the note. It's 50 moments long. That over three years, 50 different things had happened to make her feel like she wasn't good enough, that God didn't love her, that... that she wasn't enough for me, that she wasn't enough for Jesus. And it's like so much pain. There was such a wake being caused because I was hurt so much. There were leaders that were hurt in the process. And it's because I'm in pain and I couldn't see it because I felt like it was just my storm. I didn't even know how bad it was until Monday. How does that happen? How can you be in so much pain that you can't see that other people are hurting? It's because your pain isolates you. You get in moments and you're hurting so much that you're not worried about everything else. You're just trying to stay alive. You're just trying to make it through the gap. You're just trying to do you and just not lose your stuff on everybody. And so you can't see what's happening behind you. And I was so alone and I felt so alone. I felt so isolated. I'm sitting in a driveway bawling my eyes out and I'm 15 feet away from my best friend. I can't ask her for help. I'm so alone. So caught up in my own brokenness and my own pain that I've got my best friend right next to me and I can't even see her pain. All I can tell myself is that all I do is hurt people. So you got to push them away and you get caught in your own gap and you start thinking you are the pain you feel. And when it shifts from from pain to identity, you're alone now because it's not something I'm feeling. It's who I am. And so you find yourself isolated So yeah, I get it. I get how Elijah can go from these victorious mountaintop moments to being falling apart under a tree, feeling completely alone. Yeah, I get it. I understand how you can go from seeing God do things in your life to just rewriting the entire past that it's never been good. It's never been good enough. All we've ever done is hurt each other. We don't work. This doesn't work. God's never moved. And so you get caught up and falling into all of that. And I know for me, it wasn't just like it was all miserable. I have seen God do things. Like I've seen God move in my life. I've seen God answer prayers. I've seen God pay bills. We had no money that we would come home and there would just be randomly a a check with some cash on it. There'd be randomly that you would come home. There's an envelope cash be there or bills that were supposed to be $200 for some reason or 50. I've seen God do crazy stuff. I've seen God heal my ankle. Like I tore all the ligaments in my ankle and I was not supposed to be able to walk on it. Like from left to right toward all. Supposed to be chronic. I could barely walk at times. I woke up one morning and I could jump. I've seen God heal. I watched my daughter get born. And when she was being born, the cord was wrapped around her neck. And for 35 minutes, we pushed. And all that happened was that cord got tighter and tighter and tighter. When my baby girl was born, she was blue. She couldn't breathe. 
And I found myself, God, I need you to move. God, I need you to, I need you to do something. I watched him put breath in her lungs. I watched her come back to life. I watched her breathe and she's here amazing and she's such an awesome kid. I've seen God answer prayers, but man, when I was in that driveway, you could not have told me that God was there. You could not have told me he was good. You could not have told me he had a plan because every insecurity I'd ever had was confirmed when I was told I wasn't enough. When I was told we weren't enough. See, when you get in the gap, you start rewriting history. You start replanning things and maybe you're here today And for you, you find yourself exactly like that. You've seen God do things and you're sitting here in a seat feeling alone anyways. You've seen God answer prayers. You've seen God move on your behalf, but you still feel in that seat right now that you're the only one in your storm. Or maybe you're in here and you've never seen God move. You genuinely believe that you're alone. That for you, there's not this moment, you haven't seen God answer these crazy prayers. You took your first breath and the gap began. And you feel completely isolated and alone and you don't have something to fall on like God did some amazing prayer for you. Whoever you are, wherever you are, whatever your gap feels like or how you got here, I need you to know this, that God has a plan. And not that God has created your pain for you. No, God's got a plan to make right now better and get you out. God's got a plan to use this very thing that was gonna crush you to set other people free. Romans 8, 28 says that God works all things together for the good of those who love him. And I need you to understand that whatever you are feeling right now is not too far for God to use. That however alone you feel, God is still here. God's still got a plan. God's still got something for you. He has not left you. He has not forgotten about you. He has not forsaken you. God right now has a plan for you. And this is true for Elijah. You see, Elijah's alone. And God shows up. Elijah takes a rest. The Bible said he sends an angel to feed Elijah. And Elijah wakes up and he's talking to God. And it's like, God, I'm the only one left. Why is this happening to me? God, I'm so alone. And God answers Elijah, he says, alone. And I've got the next king set up for you. Not only the next king, I've got the next prophet for you. And then he answers this right here in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 18. <laughs> Yet I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. You see, Elijah thought he was alone. He just didn't see what God was doing. God had an entire community of people set up for him, but he couldn't see it because he was stuck in the gap. He couldn't see it because he was so caught up in his own storm. It's interesting when you get in a storm. If you walk outside, the winds are howling, the rain is pouring, you can't see five feet in front of you. So all it feels like is I'm alone, but what you can't see is the people around you. What you can't see sometimes is that God's got the very answer for you, just waiting for you to lean into him. That God's got the answer. Elijah thought he was so alone, but God was just working some things out that he hadn't seen yet. That God had a whole community, a whole plan for Elijah and a way to get him out, to set him free so he could continue to do amazing things. And that was absolutely true for me. I was sitting in the driveway and I'm asking myself, God, do you love me? I know that he does, but I didn't feel like he did. You really got a plan for me, God? Can you actually do anything in my life, God? What's, What's so wrong with me? And God reminded me that I wasn't alone. You see, God had already set someone up in my life. You see, I called Jared, our lead pastor, Jared Callahan. And so that you have a little bit of context, like Jared has basically been there for me through all of the hardest moments of my life. Like basically from 13 to now, Jared has been next to me. Jared has been there for me. Jared has just loved me and been through all the garbage. And I call him and I'm like, what do I do? Where do I go? What, what's the next step? I'm alone. I'm hurt. I'm broken. I'm processed. Doing. He knows all of the baggage. He knows all of the issues. And Jared's response is, you're not alone. I'm here for you. I love you. You aren't feeling this by yourself. You have not been left. Actually, I got a plan for you. Like I've got a whole place set up for you. I've got a whole spot for you. And just like God had a community for Elijah, there was a community for me. There was a church I could call home that in the middle of my brokenness, in the middle of my chaos, in the middle of the hurt that we were feeling, I had a place that was home for me. And I thought I was isolated, but 35 miles away was the greatest church I'd ever walked through the doors at. Listen, when I say I love my church, I mean that. I love this place. This church saved my life. 
This church saved my marriage. This church saved my kids. This church has changed everything for me. I am a different person today because there's a place that I could belong even when I didn't believe. And whoever you are and wherever you are, you got to know this, that you are not alone. And I know it feels like it. And I know it seems like you've been in it forever. And I know it seems like you can't get out, but I promise you, you are not alone. This community right here loves you, that we are for you. We are not scared of your mess. We are not scared of your brokenness. Wherever you find yourself, we are ready and willing to walk through the storm with you so that you know you have not been left or forgotten. We mean it so much that at the end of today, we're gonna have some people up here at the front and whatever you're going through, wherever you're at, whatever you're feeling, we wanna talk to you. You want to hug? We want to hug you. You see someone to tell you that, you've been, that you matter, that we love you? We want to do that. And you just want someone to listen, somewhere that you can vent. We want to be here for you, but we mean every bit of that. This church wasn't just here for me. It's here for you. But this is a home. And when we say you can belong before you believe, we mean that. That we want to see God's absolute best for you. Whatever that looks, whatever we got to do, however we got to be a part of that, we want to be a part of it. So please do not walk out these doors today thinking you're alone because this church is here for you. We love you so much. We think God's got beautiful plans for your life. We, got, we believe there are things that God wants to do only through you. If you just need someone to talk to, we want to talk to you. It's interesting because, you know, not only are we here, maybe for you today, your gap feels, it's not ministry. You're not called to preach or whatever, but maybe for you, you lost your job and you still haven't been able to find one. Maybe for you, you had a marriage that you gave everything you had into. You tried to put everything you could into it. You worked your hardest and it still fell apart. Maybe for you, you have tried so hard to parent your kids, so hard to love them, so hard to be there for them, but they seem like they're just not responding. Whatever your gap is, God is here for you. The Bible says this in chapter, in Psalms chapter 34, 18 through 19. It says, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He's here. And not like ethereally here, like God is right now in your life, in your moment. Last week we talked about how God is good. And I want to build on that. God isn't just good, he's near. God isn't just good, he's near. That wherever you find yourself, yeah, God's doing something amazing. Yes, God's working things behind the scenes. Yes, God is working out a great plan for your life. But he isn't just back here moving strings. God is in your pain. God is in your storm. God is in your mess. God is right now willing, ready and willing to wrap his arms around you. God is here. That he's near. He's close to the brokenhearted. He will pull you out of it. The Bible says he'll deliver you from it. I promise you that if you'll trust God long enough, he's going to work something out. You're going to look back in six months. You're going to look back in here. You're going to look back and see, oh my God, God, how did you do that? I'm standing here right now. You're youth pastor. And that doesn't happen if God doesn't have a plan. Because I was ready to quit everything. I'm standing here with an amazing marriage. My wife is awesome. She is killing it. Her life is great. She's got life group leaders. Woo, my... Every Wednesday, man, she's got a group of girls that she's investing in and pouring into. I just, it's not just my marriage, my kids are good. We had to baptize my daughter this year, man. Whew. That would have never happened had I quit in the gap. It would have never happened if I gave up. It would have never happened if I let Satan convince me that God wasn't good. It would never have happened if I let, listened to the lie that I was alone. So please hear me that you are not alone. God is not just good, he's near. God has a plan that he is ready and willing to rescue you from. So today, wherever you're at, whatever you're going through, whatever you're feeling, listen to me. You are not alone. We love you. We are here for you. If you need someone to talk to today, please do not leave this room without having a conversation. We want to pray with you. We want to be with you. We want to be next to you. We want to walk through this with you. And if you're in here and you feel like God's forgotten you, he's not just good. He's near. He's close to your heart. He, feel, he feels your pain. He understands what you're going through. And he's ready to love you with all that he is. You're not alone. This church loves you and God's next to you. Let's pray. We're so glad you joined us for today's message at the Brick Church. If you're still hanging out, you may be wondering, how can I be a part? Well, we'd love to connect with you. Shoot us a message, connect with us. But if you'd like to give, there's two easy ways to give. 
You can give through the text number, which is 45888. You'll simply text the word BRICK. That's 45888, and it'll set you up with a credit card, debit card, or bank account. The other way you can give is through our website, thebrick.church slash give. Whichever way you give, thank you for being a part of all that God is doing here at the Brick Church. And you are contributing to be a part of leading people to become fully devoted followers of Christ.